Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. In the many cases, welcome back to many of you. I'm particularly happy to welcome so many veterans of the Nixon administration who are here for this Nixon Legacy Forum, the greatest comeback, Richard Nixon and the 1968 election. Some of you have already been participants in earlier Nixon forums. This is kind of the gathering of the Klan. The last time we were all together was in Yorba Linda in October of 2016 for the opening of the new Nixon Library exhibit. And now I can welcome you here to the National Archives. The first Nixon Legacy Forum was held right here in the McGowan Theater in January of 2010. Over the last eight years, there have been more than 30 of these forums covering all aspects, almost all aspects, of President Nixon's consequential administration. Most of them have been here in the McGowan Theater, and most have been covered by C-SPAN, and it's good to see that C-SPAN is with us again today. All of these forums have been filmed and recorded by the Nixon Foundation, and they're now an important part of the historical record available for students and scholars and any interested individual on the websites of the National Archives and the Nixon Library and the Nixon Foundation. Forum topics have covered both foreign and domestic policy as well as managerial, the managerial revolution that President Nixon ushered into the West Wing and that marked the creation of the modern executive office of the president. This afternoon, of course, we're going back into the pre-presidential history with the campaign of 1968 that launched the Nixon presidency. The Nixon Legacy Forums bring together men and women who served in the Nixon administration to, to discuss some of the particular issues and programs that they worked on back in the day. Their conversations are complemented and supplemented my, by materials documents, tape recordings, videos, and photographs from the Nixon Library archives. For historians, and particularly future historians, this kind of resource is all but invaluable. To be able to watch and hear the people who were making history describe exactly how it was made is a unique opportunity. This is the kind of backstage, backstairs, backstory that documents simply can't convey but that is no less important in order to understand and appreciate what really happened and why. Many years in history, many years in history, devotees who believe that their year is key, the key that opens the door to everything that followed. Recently, books have argued for the significance of 1913, the world on the eve of the Great War in 1920, the year six former and future presidents joined battle for the White House. 1939 was the countdown to war. 1944 was the year that FDA, the FDR changed history. But I think that one year on which everyone agrees is 1968, whether it's seen as a flashpoint, a watershed, or a tipping point. There's no question that the issues, the events, the personalities, the struggles, the trends, not to mention the stakes made 1968 a year unmatched by few other years in history. And that was true not only here, but all around the world. Of course, 1968 was a presidential year, and that campaign reflected all of that year's unsettled and unsettling aspects, considering the context, riots, assassinations, bombings, communication gaps and generation gaps, and Americans dug in on different sides of most issues. Some asked why anyone would even want to be president in a year like 1968. Richard Nixon did, and on the morning of November 6th, his election as our 37th president was confirmed. 1968 was already a year of 50th anniversaries of Nixon milestones. January 31st marked the 50th anniversary of when he announced his presidential candidacy. March 12th marked the 50th anniversary of his decisive victory in the New Hampshire primary. Last month on August 8th was the 50th anniversary of his memorable acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention in Miami Beach. And of course, November 6th will be the golden anniversary of his election to that office. The Nixon, Nixon Library, which is part of the National Archives system of presidential libraries, will be celebrating many of these anniversaries. If you have the good fortune to find yourself in Yorba Linda anytime soon, 
I recommend a special exhibit that opened at the Nixon Library last month, Vote Like Your Whole World Depended on It, the story of the 1968 election. This exhibit is a partnership between the Nixon Library and the Nixon Foundation, and we're honored by the presence of the Foundation's chairman, Dr. James Cavanaugh, and its president and CEO, Bill Barabalt, here with us this afternoon. Bill is over here. There you are. Welcome. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jeff Shepard, who will moderate this forum and introduce its par participants. Jeff was a selected a White House Fellow in 1969 and assigned to the Treasury Department, where he worked under Paul Volcker, then Under Secretary for Monetary Affairs. Following his fellowship year, Jeff joined John Ehrlichman's domestic counsel staff at the White at the Nixon White House, where he served five years and another year in a, and as Associate Director of General Government in the Ford White House. The author of The Secret Plot to Elect Ted Kennedy President and The Real Watergate Scandal, for the past three decades, Jeff has arranged and hosted annual reunions of the Nixon Ford policy planning staffs and since 2010 has produced the Nixon Legacy Series. Please welcome Jeff Shepard. David, thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have done these forums uh, in, in co-sponsorship with the National Archives, and David and his people have just been tremendously helpful, and we're happy to be here again. Uh, Richard Nixon's public life saw highs and lows, incredible highs and incredible lows. Uh, we're here today, which is the 50th anniversary of the uh, 1968 election, to talk about one of the highs and to celebrate one of the highs. It doesn't mean that we aren't mindful of the lows, but that's going to be a topic for other forums. For today, we've gathered four people who worked on President Nixon's campaign, uh, then Richard Nixon's campaign, uh, and they're going to share their memories. And it's a, it's a wonderful group. Uh, we're going to go in order of how long they knew Richard Nixon. So Ken, Ken is the recent one, I mean, he's known for years now, but Ken was a, uh, a researcher uh, uh, taking off time from uh, Columbia Law School, where he was a law student. And uh, uh, Annalise and her husband, Martin, formed the domestic advisory group. Uh, Marty flew with the campaign, and Annalise ran the home base doing all the hard work. Uh, uh, Pat Buchanan requires no introduction. Pat's uh, a fantastic guy and, and uh, joined Nixon way before the campaign. And finally, we get to Dwight Chapin, who is even senior to Pat in terms of knowing Nixon, but, of course, not in terms of running the campaign. So what we're going to do is start with each of them explaining to, to us how they met Richard Nixon and how they came to be a participant in the campaign. Ken, we'll start with you. Thank you, Jeff. Well, actually, in uh, uh, 1962, as a freshman at UC Santa Barbara on the debate, on the debate team, I uh, cornered him at a rally he did at uh, San Marcos High School and where he gave me some debate pointers. Uh, and then in uh, 1967, as a uh, law student, second year law student at uh, Columbia, I saw an article in the New York Times uh, by Bob Semple with a photo of uh, a fel uh, some fellows on the stage, Pat Buchanan and Dwight Chapin and Marty Anderson and Len Garment, Ray Price, Tom Evans, as the new young fellows around Nixon. And I've always been a political junkie and decided that uh, I might like to work on that campaign if they'd let me. So I wrote a letter to Mr. Nixon and, and uh, said, I'd like to work on your campaign. And um, my wife, Meredith, worked on uh, at, at 30 Wall Street, just around the corner from 20 Broad. And she hand delivered it to somebody at the uh, 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 reception desk there at 20 Broad Street. And um, uh, about two or three weeks later, I got a letter back from this guy over here, Pat Buchanan, said, why don't you come on in for an interview? And so I went in to see Pat, and uh, at first he thought I was a Rockefeller spy, since, <laughs> since I was from Columbia. 
I may have had a beard at the time, I can't recall. <laughs> and uh, he asked me a lot of tough questions, some of which I didn't know the answer to. But in any event, uh, he said, why don't you come on in? And I started out as a volunteer answering correspondence with Ann, then Ann Volz, and then later Ann Volz Higgins. And uh, pestered Dwight and Marty Anderson and Pat every chance I got to do research. And, and uh, Marty figured I, I might be able to help him out. And in uh, May of that year, he said, uh, why don't you come on in and work full time? And so I'm starting in June, after, as soon as school was out, I started working full time at the headquarters at 450 Park. That's my story. And you talked your way into the campaign. I talked to my, mm -hmm. I, uh, answering the correspondence was really boring, I have to tell you. <laughs> so the first chance I got, I'd, I'd give them research, ideas, quotes, and whatnot. So I wheedled my way into the <coughs> research staff. Super. Annalise, how about you? How did you come to Richard Nixon's attention? Well, I got involved in the campaign basically because my husband got involved. And he was, I was a graduate student at Columbia, and he was a professor at Columbia. And we met someone for dinner from Nixon's law firm who said, you really ought to talk to, you ought to, with your views, you ought to be working for Richard Nixon. And so Len Garment and Martin got in touch, and Len Garment basically recruited uh, Martin and the first thing that Martin did for Richard Nixon, one of the first things, in it was it's dated July 4th, 1967, is to make the arguments for abolishing the middle military draft and moving to an all-volunteer armed force. And Martin, like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other young men in the country had dealt with the issue of getting drafted. And he had joined ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps at Dartmouth, and went on to be a member, a reserve member of the Army Security Agency. Now, I'm going to interrupt for just a second because I yeah? neglected to move the slides. Oh, you so did? So you're going to start to see slides, <laughs> pictures of these people from 50 years ago. Oh, okay. And here's, That's me. Here's Annalise. I okay? wish I still looked like that. And this is, I, I apologize, yeah. I, did, I didn't bring this up, but this is Annalise hard at work on the campaign. Okay, it's supposedly Florida, but I don't know the convention, where uh, I did a lot of things in the campaign. We did, Ken and I did a lot of the same things. We did research. We responded to requests from the tour. We drafted statements. Uh, we looked things up and got things ready in a difficult environment of communications. And so that's uh, basically how I got involved. I had actually, um, I, don't, I can't blame this entirely on Martin because I had voted for Richard Nixon in 1960 and I worked in the Goldwater campaign. So it was a natural now what, progression. What Annalise and Martin and Ken did, and we're going to jump ahead a little bit, is toward the end of the campaign, Nixon was accused of just campaigning and not doing, not having taken any substantive positions. So the research staff was asked to put together, under tremendous stress, all of Nixon's positions. And this picture shows President Nixon really with two volumes. And there's a copy of the And, and yeah, Annalise has another one there, right? Right. right. Okay, it'll, it'll be on the exam. You'll have to be able to remember. Right. It's Nixon on the issues. And, and this proved, but, but what, was, what was fantastic was this staff was able to pull out all this information from previous speeches and previous campaign stops. Well, let, let us tell the story, Bill. <laughs> The story is this, uh, having been accused of not having positions on the issues, at one point, uh, Mr. Nixon out of nowhere said, I've taken positions on 147 a hard issue. And we said, where did he come up with that number? So that's when the staff went into full uh, <laughs> panic mode right. and, and started, Annalise, you can tell the rest. Well, we ended up with 227 issues, both foreign and domestic <laughs> policy. And once you know how many you need, you know how to slice the sausage, right? We worked in 96 uh, hours. We produced this document. And 
Yes, Bill Casey, who was working with the Nixon campaign, owned the printing press that printed it. Mm -hmm. And you understand you can't do this at the time on a computer. Mm -hmm. There aren't any computers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, set in type, and, it, and we had books. We got the request on Sunday. We had books on Friday. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And he passed them out to the press and said, here, mm -hmm. I have taken positions so there. on yeah. that. <laughs> so there. <laughs> so then we moved to Pat. Right. And Trump had more than 247 issues. <laughs> <laughs> Trump had we, thousands. We, we, let, me, let, let me start with a picture. Let right. me start with a picture. Uh, uh, we're going to get to Pat's book in a minute, but we got this wonderful picture mm -hmm. of Pat and Dwight, and they mm -hmm. look like teenagers. I mean, mm -hmm. look at them. <laughs> Dark hair, mm -hmm. in charge. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pat. Well, <clears throat> I first met Richard Nixon in 1954, I believe. I was a caddy on the caddy bench at Burning Tree Country Club. In the afternoon, when everybody else had gone out with their bags, and the, and the deputy pro put a plaid bag out on the caddy the bench, and it was that of the Vice President of the United States, and he looked over at me and my buddy, and he, we were the last two guys, and he said, come on. So I moved around that entire 18 holes of Burning Tree Country Club with the golfer Richard Nixon, who bore no resemblance whatsoever to Arnold Palmer in those days. <laughs> and that was an experience I told my family and friends when I got home that afternoon. Ten years later, I was an editorial writer, young editorial writer for the St. Louis Globe Democrat, who'd spent three and a half years there. And I wanted to get involved in the politics of 68. I had been pro Goldwater, and that ended a disaster. And so Richard Nixon was speaking in Belleville, Illinois. And there was a cocktail party after his speech in a place called uh, Don Hesse's, the cartoonist, who was a cartoonist for our paper, in his home. And I went into his kitchen at around midnight. I got an invite, went up to Nixon and said, look, if you're going to run in 1968, I'd like to get aboard earlier. And he said, well, first we've got to win 66, et cetera. And so he called around and got a lot of material <coughs> on me, invited me to New York. I went up there for a three-hour interview with Nixon from 3 to 6 in the evening in his law firm. And he said, I'm going to hire you for one year. And we'll see how well it goes. And with the campaign, I want you to write a column for me. I want you to do all this mail and get rid of these piles of mail. And I want you to handle the press. And what we did is we spent, I'd say I spent three hours a day talking to Richard Nixon almost every day. He sat there in that law firm, and he would call me in, and he told me once, you know, if I had to practice law, Pat, I'd be mentally dead in two years and physically dead in four. He loved politics, policy, issues, personality. He couldn't get enough of it. He wanted to know all about the conservative movement. And he obviously, his mind was, he was very, very young in his mind then. And, we, I traveled with him in that campaign of 1966. We had something like 35 states and 80 congressional districts. And at the end of it, the Republicans had the greatest victory since 1946 in the 80th Congress. Nixon had been the guy that done all the work out there. And at the end of the campaign, after we kept goading Johnson with statements, and one of them we got in the New York Times, Johnson foolishly attacked Nixon two days before the election, or four days and a savage attack, personal attack, called him a chronic campaigner, denounced him, and right away the cameras came to Richard Nixon. <laughs> Nixon was invited on all the Sunday shows. He responded very graciously. I understand how a candidate can be tired as the president is. <laughs> you know, referring back to his own last press conference, but it vaulted Nixon up again into real prominence and a potential presidential candidate, and by the time June, uh, November and December were over. Romney was running first, Governor Romney's, Mitt Romney's father. But Nixon was a close second, and when it came to the grassroots of the party, Nixon already had it. Fantastic. <clears throat> now, we go to Dwight, far, far right side, stage left, uh, and we have pictures of Dwight alone. He, Dwight gave us the pictures. <laughs> but here you, have, here you have Dwight as young they, man. <laughs> they didn't use them all, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Well, in 1962, Mr. Nixon was going to run for governor. He had lost in 60 to Jack Kennedy. Uh, 
And I didn't have a job that summer, and my dad said I had to have a job, and I went down to the headquarters and was interviewed by a man by the name of Herb Kombach, who took me down the hall and introduced me to a young crew cut guy, 33 years old, by the name of Bob Haldeman. Uh, <clears throat> my life changed at that moment. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I became a field man in Southern California for Ventura, Santa Barbara counties, and the San Fernando Valley. And, you know, I'm, I'm 21 years old, and I'm out setting up campaign headquarters working with the women's network that we had, and in those days we did precinct sheets and everything else. We lost. I couldn't believe it. Uh, drove around L.A. all day sobbing. Uh, my life was destroyed. I still hadn't graduated from college, but my life was over. Uh, <clears throat> Bob Haldeman hired me to go to J. Walter Thompson, and what was intriguing there was that he would take these monthly trips back to New York, where Nixon had moved, and uh, come back and spin stories, tell me stories, about how Nixon was, going, was plotting for his comeback. This is in 1963. Uh, in 1964, having decided that he was going to weigh in with Goldwater, I went to the convention, helped out there as his aide. In 1966, I had moved to New York, and uh, upon arrival in New York, I contacted Rosemary Woods, said that I would like to volunteer, and I went down to 20 Broad Street after work at nights and answered correspondence. Rose Woods was my boss. Pat was in an office sitting near her. Uh, there was a desk there, as Pat identifies in his book, that Patricia Ryan Nixon uh, used when she came in. But when I would go down in the evenings to answer correspondence, my tutor was Mrs. Nixon. So she really got to know me, and I got to know the staff. Uh, in 1966, then I became an advance man, when, uh, and as Pat described that, incredible campaign where Nixon is out there on the stump for everyone. It happened to be that the day that Lyndon Johnson called Nixon a chronic campaigner, the first stop after that incident was mine in Waterville, Maine, my first stop. And I had Mike Wallace coming in. He had just interviewed right. Nixon in, at the airport in LaGuardia. Right. Uh, we tried to slow your plane, the president's plane down in order to get Wallace there. I mean, it was uh, right. A big deal at the time, believe me. And then it converted into Nixon going on national television. Right. The RNC gave him a half hour of time, and it was it a huge was, thing. It was huge. I was on the Nixon went in there was being interviewed by Wallace at LaGuardia, and he said, "Pat, listen to Johnson's press conference and tell me what he says." So Nixon came out and got in the plane. Said, "You're not going to believe what he's been calling you for ten minutes." And so Nixon was. I mean, he handles it very well. He said sit down and just tell me what he said. And we gave him the details of what he said. Mike Wallace found out and caught a, took a jet after yeah, a Yeah, they, they chartered a jet to get to Waterville ahead of the other plane. We had to slow your plane down right. in order to get the it Wallace people there. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, needless to say that really, my juices were flowing by this time. And so that was in November and in December, Bob Haldeman said, you're going to get a call from Rosemary Woods. And Rose called, and I went down, uh, and Mr. Nixon interviewed me to become his personal aide. He said, I think I'm going to run for president. Here's how it would work. And so I joined his staff as a personal, his personal aide in 1967, March of 1967, the same day that our good friend Ray Price joined mm -hmm. the staff. And uh, I never missed, never missed one domestic trip with Mr. Nixon from that time through to when he was elected president. Well, let me say, when you came aboard at the same time, Shelley Scarney came aboard, <laughs> who's Mrs. Buchanan, and Shelley was with Richard Nixon in his vice presidential office in 1959 and 60, traveled that campaign, worked in the 62 campaign, traveled in the campaign for Goldwater in 64, all around the country, came back in 1967, which is when I met her when she arrived, and we were in that little office with Pat Ryan, who was Mrs. Nixon. Folks would call and say, I know Mrs. Nixon, please put me through to the vice president. 
And Mrs. Nixon would say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't put you through. It was, they were talking to the first, future first lady. And, and the other thing is we, we had uh, Rose, Pat, and myself in this one little office, and right outside was Shelley, and then in the office adjacent to uh, Mr. Nixon's office was a very important person who had arrived with his pipe and so forth, and that was John Mitchell. We mm -hmm. were all in a corner there. We were on the senior partner's floor, both <laughs> Dwight and I. <laughs> we knew so much about law, it was great that we were on the senior That's partner's good. floor. That's good. <clears throat> now, we found a slide, and, and if you were here for the roll of pictures before, th there's a much better version of this that came up in color uh, uh, that w enabled us to, uh, to see this. But talk about the, the speechwriters that are in the slide. This is in Long Beach. This is, well, I can tell you the speechwriters basically, I came aboard and was doing excerpts in 1966, one page excerpts which Nixon would put into his speeches. But in 67, after our great year in 66 uh, with a huge victory, the president, I mean, the future president told me he wanted to hire someone to balance me because he thought I might be a little far to the right. <laughs> and so, so I went out and got, all, got a list of the best, brightest young writers who were moderate sort of Republicans, and I came back to Nixon and I said, the very best one <coughs> is uh, Ray Price, former editorial editor of the Herald Tribune, which I believe had gone down by, gone under by then. But uh, I said, one problem is he's not a great admirer of yours, and he wrote the endorsement of Lyndon Johnson in <laughs> 1964. So Nixon told me, and again, it's an attribute of Nixon's, he said, listen, Pat, I don't care whether he likes me or not, or likes us, or agrees with us. Bring him in here. After the first battle, he will be a loyalist. Nixon believed in that, that, that the, in the fires of battle and things, loyalties are created that don't exist before then. People who come to work for you may look at it as a job, but with all the battles you're in together, suddenly there's a real bond that is created. So we have Price on the end, and then Pat. Uh, Marty Anderson, Bill Gavin, uh, I think Jim and Jim Keogh. Keogh. Jim Keogh. Yeah. Jim Keogh. Jim Keogh. That's how magazine. we reconstructed it. And this was the traveling, the traveling squad. So the traveling these speechwriters. Yeah. These were these were on the campaign. They were on the campaign, campaign plane. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And everybody ended up in the White House. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. they should have. Okay. We have two slides, and and our panelists <laughs> have already covered them. The importance, before we get to 1968, the importance of the Goldwater campaign where Nixon, Nixon campaigned for Goldwater. Did you guys have anything else to add about that? I can add something. <clears throat> At the convention in 1964 in San Francisco, on Sunday night, the convention would be launched on Monday. On Sunday night, Dick and Pat Nixon had a we want to thank you reception for all of the delegates. This was a very calculated thing. And the line went, came, the St. Francis Hotel, the line went down the stairs and out the front door. I mean, every delegate came. And the phenomenal thing, and I was, I had the privilege of standing right there with them through this whole thing. He, they knew everybody. I mean, this was one of uh, RN's really hallmarks. He knew everybody in that party and all of these delegates and of course uh, what he wanted to do was to reestablish contact with them they wanted to thank them but it, it kind of set up a premise that we followed through on not only in 64 when he went all over the country for Goldwater but in 66 and into the mm -hmm. election and then we go to the 66 uh, and, we, and we talked about the midterms when, when you uh, mm -hmm. recovered nicely anything well, else to add on this well, let's see, there, Nixon made a number of strategic moves. One of them has been mentioned, endorsing Goldwater in 64. This came after the disaster of 62 when he lost for a second time to Pat Brown. He had his last press conference. Everybody wrote him off. He moved to New York. But the key <coughs> things, the key moments there were the endorsement of Goldwater. Not only that, Nixon, Shelley, my wife, was with him. 64 campaigned harder for Goldwater than Goldwater did himself. And the key part of that is, the conservative movement had taken over the party. It couldn't win a national election, but it had taken over the party, 
And the fact that Nixon went out for these folks when Governor Romney and Governor Rockefeller and Governor Scranton basically abandoned Goldwater in, in 65, the very first January of 65, Barry Goldwater said, if Dick Nixon, if you run for president, you've got my support. That meant the Goldwater movement had, it was moving to Nixon at the same time Nixon had a base in the party. And it was the beginning of the transfer of power inside the Republican Party from the party of Eisenhower and Nixon in the 50s to the party of Nixon and Reagan, which would dominate the, uh, dominate the 70s and 80s. And we, we got all of the Goldwater people, the Cliff Whites, Dick Kleindienst, Bob mm -hmm. Mardian, all those people came over. But this thing really started at the, immediately, immediately, I mean mm -hmm. within three weeks after the assassination of Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Because the decision at that point, the strategic meeting in New York was, I am not going to, Goldwater's too close to getting it, I can't intercede there. What I'll do is I'll throw everything I can against it and do everything I can help. And that, that mm -hmm. was his basic start of the strategy. So he, he wasn't on the ballot, but he certainly didn't sit it out. No. Well, in 64, he campaigned he harder worked, for Goldwater that's than what Goldwater did himself. <laughs> you know? All right. We go to the campaign of 68. We're, about, we're through with the introduction. We're, we're, we're actually about ready to start. Uh, but first... <laughs> We want to show you the, the New York, this is a map we put together, I didn't do it of course, uh, of, of the New York operations. Uh, Dwight, you, you, you and uh, uh, Annalise can talk about this? Yeah, I think the main, one of the main points we want to make here is that this was a New York campaign. I mean, <clears throat> you don't think of New, Richard Nixon and New York really, but I mean his apartment was there at 810 Fifth Avenue. Uh, the finance operation with Maury Stans. In the Bible building, we had the, the research and the research the writers. And the, uh, everybody. Yeah. That included, by the way, Alan Pat. Greenspan yes. in charge of all of the uh, Alan, domestic Alan the and, and Dick Richard Allen. Dick Allen, Dick right. Allen was Alan there. Said. So some right. really people that would become national icons later on were at the hub of that. Mm -hmm. And then, then at 455 Park, it's where we had John Mitchell, we had Peter Flanagan, Haldeman had his office when he was off of the road there, as did some of the rest of us. And then, very important, that is where John Whitaker, who would later become cabinet secretary, and Ken Cole, one of our great buddies, they ran the scheduling operation and all of the advanced men. We had 90 advanced men out at all times, mm -hmm. 90. So the, that was all run out of that 455 park. Mm -hmm. Super. Now we come to uh, the reason Pat's on the stage, aside from being a super guy. <laughs> Pat wrote the definitive book on, on the 68 campaign and, and, and the comeback. And what we've asked him to do is to go through what he remembers as the highlights of the campaign, <laughs> basically to remind the audience that it wasn't just a continuous uh, uh, forum, it was interspersed with unexpected developments. And so I'm gonna, uh, I, I will try to keep up with Pat on the slides. Well, it was the most divisive year in American history since the Civil War. What you're seeing there is a picture from the Tet Offensive. Nixon, Dwight, and I flew to Boston the night the Tet Offensive began on January 31. Within a month, there are 1,000 dead Americans, 50,000 Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops had invaded all the provincial capitals it had broken the spirit of a lot of people in the United States. American elites were starting to turn against the war. And the Tet Offensive, even though it was a military disaster for the communists, was a political victory for them, which would, which would reverberate through the years. That started the night we took off to Boston, and, and we, we, we took Richard Nixon when we got to Boston, Jeff, and we, we put him into a motel and registered him as Mr. Benjamin Chapman, so we could sneak him over to New Hampshire the next morning and file him in the primary. In the New York Times the next morning when Nixon's announcement was a single column, they had a picture of that Viet Cong, or the Viet, uh, the South Vietnamese head of security executing the Viet Cong by putting a bullet oh, to yeah. his head. Very famous. It was Very a famous. famous photo, but it was the same day. Take a look at the picture in the New York Times, four columns. There's a single column shot 
of Nixon's a single column story of Nixon's announcement. We can move on from there. And this is the February 2nd, that's the Nixon announcement in New Hampshire. It, great, it was a great event. Nixon did very well there. And one of the things, I think, Dwight, the important things to look at is the change in Nixon's handling of himself in New Hampshire. Unlike 1960, when he and Kennedy wore themselves thin and almost killed themselves campaigning, Nixon, we'd worked out something whereby Nixon would make two major events a day to get the headlines, and we'd rest him, give him time. And while, while his opponent, you can move it right now, Mr. Romney, Romney was going to coffee clashes in New Hampshire, November, December, January, but, but he, was, he was just spinning his wheels, getting nowhere. Our polls had us four to one or five to one ahead. We were heading for a New Hampshire wipeout of Romney when he quit the race. Dropped out on February 29th, I believe it was. Was out of the race and denied us our victory. And that was a tremendous blow to us because we thought that huge victory would wipe out Nixon the loser image. Nixon the, had some unkind comments about the, the governor when he dropped out. We can move on here. All right, this here is, there's Gene McCarthy. Be clean with Gene was the motto in, in New Hampshire. I used to see those kids, they'd come by our motel where we were staying with their signs for Gene McCarthy. You know, they were young leftist kids, but I will say they were extremely well behaved in New Hampshire. And what McCarthy did, he won. He got 42% of the vote in New Hampshire to Lyndon Johnson's 49%. A tremendous moral victory for McCarthy. The folly of it was Lyndon Johnson wasn't even on the ballot. This was political malpractice of an extraordinary order. Johnson won as a write-in candidate in New Hampshire, the President of the United States. And so it was inexplicable, but the, 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 the excitement and enthusiasm almost blocked out the fact that Nixon himself, is, maybe it's the next one, Nixon himself, people looked at it, if you looked at it closely, you added Nixon's votes. Nixon got a lot of write-ins in the Democratic primary thanks to a, a little <laughs> subterfuge we had going. He beat Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, four to one in the Democratic primary. But Nixon's total vote, people didn't look at it in, in the enthusiasm of McCarthy, total vote exceeded all the other candidates in both parties right in or on the ballot. Reagan, Romney, everyone. Rockefeller, the whole bunch of them. So Nixon was really off to a tremendous start. In this four days after New Hampshire, let's move it here. Four days, is this uh, the 16th? Four days after New Hampshire, Bobby Kennedy, seeing an opportunity, seeing what Gene McCarthy had done, leapt into the race. And frankly, he's Bobby Kennedy is we saw the 50th anniversaries of his death and everything, but he was excoriated as a complete opportunist. I remember Maury Kempton, who was a great friend of mine, one of the great writers I admired, who loved Kennedy, but he said, here, Gene McCarthy's gone out, bled, fought, and died, and Robert Kennedy is coming down from the hills to shoot the wounded. He's an opportunist. And uh, it was a savage column, but people were talking about Kennedy that way, and Kennedy was attacking Johnson for unleashing the, the dark forces in the, of the American spirit. Four days later, we expected Rockefeller, Dwight and I had been asked by Nixon to watch on television while uh, Rockefeller made his announcement to jump in against us and replace Romney as the leader of the establishment. Rockefeller announced he was not going to run at the press conference, we went into the, <laughs> we went into the room with Nixon and said, we can't believe it. He's announced he's not going to run. What did Nixon say? Nixon said, it's the girl. It, Drew Pearson, <laughs> Drew Pearson had written columns in, in December we'd followed, said that Rockefeller had a new girlfriend, and we, Dwight and I, somehow had run down her name. We knew her name. <laughs> we knew her name, but when Rockefeller didn't announce, that's what Nixon said. And I remember Nick Timish, the reporter, would, came to me repeatedly and said, Pat, what did Nixon say <laughs> when you <laughs> told him? We couldn't him. say what Nixon said. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't tell him. <laughs> so I just didn't say anything. So let's, let's move on from, now here, I, because of the, Vietnam became such an issue with Gene McCarthy and the Tet Offensive, Nixon decided he may have to change his policy. So we were at his apartment, Ray Price and I, and Richard Whalen, who was a tremendously gifted writer, but he was a tough dog. We were in the dog. car landing at LaGuardia. 
let's say, you know, this is the, uh, this is no, yeah, but this is what we're, we're working on a speech, and we got a call from Frank Shakespeare, and we were in Nixon's apartment on Vietnam, and Frank said, Lyndon Johnson wants to take live, live uh, oh. wants live time on CBS. So uh, Nixon told me he was going to Wisconsin. We canceled our speech. And he said, listen to Johnson's speech in the limo. They're going to pick me up when I come back from a one-day stop in Wisconsin and tell me what he says on Vietnam and report it to me. So I'm in the car with his, drover, his chauffeur, this wonderful black fellow, and he and I are talking and listening to Johnson, and here comes Johnson at the end of the speech and says, I will not accept, I will not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party. And I'm on the runway, and the reporters are starting out, and Nixon's plane's coming in. I said, get this car down to that plane. And so I finally got out of the limo and ran to the plane, got on and told Nixon what had happened. And you know, he dropped, Romney had dropped out, Rockefeller dropped out, now Johnson had dropped out. So Nixon comes out and says, well, I guess it's the year of the dropout, you know. <laughs> you still, well, <laughs> that was not his greatest <laughs> moment, but it, was, uh, but it was extraordinary that this had happened. And, and the whole, it was a brand new ball game because now Rockefeller was out, but Humphrey was in the Democratic race against McCarthy and against Bobby Kennedy. So they had a three-way race going. And then four days later, four days later, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis. Enormous jolt, and I will say this, Dr. King. It's uh, his, of course. It's, this has become an enormous event in American history. But when King, in by by 1968, King was a far more controversial figure than he was when I saw him on the March on Washington in '63. But then, the, when he was shot in 1968, what happened following that was that 100 American cities exploded in riots and violence, including my hometown of D.C., 7th Street Corridor, we're right on 7th Street over there, 14th Street Corridor, were all burned, gutted. You had troops in all the streets. You had airborne troops called out. You had Marines got, had, had mounted a machine gun on the Capitol steps. And this happened in 100 cities. It went on for a week, and it was a horrendous blow to the country, obviously, and, uh, and a real dividing point in American history, undeniably. I, I want to add something real quick there. <clears throat> the foundation has on its website, and then also that you can find it on YouTube, uh, Mr. Nixon going to the Martin Luther King funeral and the stories around that. And it's mm -hmm. quite interesting, and mm -hmm. anybody doing research ought to that's mm -hmm. interested in that ought to go see that. Yeah, well, let me just say, Dwight went with uh, Mr. Nixon and Mr. Nixon, before the funeral, flew to Atlanta and took a limo, got a limo, and take him to Mrs. King's house and met personally with her before he flew on to Miami, and Miami, excuse me, to Key Biscayne. Then he came back up and he marched in the funeral. And there are pictures of, of Nixon marching in that funeral. <coughs> yes, he, uh, I, I, think I, I, I was there. And, and <coughs> one of the things that after he left seeing uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, we went over to uh, Dr. King's father's home uh, in, in a beautiful part of Atlanta, and they, they were having kind of a, all their friends were there and so forth. And the thing that I will never forget was when uh, Mr. Nixon walked in there and walked up to Dr. King Sr., and they greeted each other and hugged each other and are patting each other on the back. back. It was like a moment that was just mm -hmm. unbelievable. Well, people forget, too, in 1957, Nixon supported the, in the back scenes, supported the Civil Rights Act of 1957, had a personal letter from Dr. King thanking him for all he had done. I guess this is the, this is the troops, is the troops that must be in Washington, D.C. But it was amazing, I mean, to, to see your own hometown like that, burning in all these areas, some of them over in the Northeast also, but up 7th and 14th Street corridor. Okay, go ahead after, let's see. This, in the same month here, in April 12th, about eight days after, just as these riots were dying down, the worst campus violence in, in American history, I believe, occurred up at Columbia University. That's right. Where Annalise, Annalise, I was a graduate of Columbia, and Annalise, you were still there at the time. Yeah, I was yes, there. I was a graduate. Yeah, so K was KK a was there. And I so was they, there. They took there. over. They took. So was I. I wasn't at the riot, but I yeah. was. There. I was at the riot. I think I see you in I there, Ken. I was at the riot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marty was in the faculty meeting. 
Or he was to when they out what to do. Well, they occupied the, the they occupied the, yes. they occupied the president's office. Do you yeah, want well, to say anything about it? They're smoking Grayson Kirk's uh, cigars, and and uh, Mark Rudd was there. And then when the cops came in with their big stallions, Mark Rudd, the, 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 the weasley little coward, uh, scooted out the back door so, mm -hmm. so he wouldn't get caught. Um, but anyway, that, that was the. And, and but Columbia was the first school to get shut down. Well, it's but, shut down, but the early, the, it had started in some of the schools, Berkeley 64. Berkeley in 64. It was the number one, was the number first the one. I was writing editor, editorials all the time. Interesting about this, Hubert Humphrey and Bobby Kennedy had been conciliatory toward the, uh, toward the, some of the riots and demonstrators in the early days, and we had quotes on them. I remember Hubert Humphrey said, you know, if I were under these conditions, I could leave a pretty good riot myself. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounded good in the early days, but by the time these things were really exploding and the whole issue of law and order, which we'll talk mm -hmm. about, was accelerating, and it, was no longer, it was no longer just Goldwater four years before. The whole country was up in arms over what was going on. I wrote a statement for Nixon that was in dispute in the staff, and he issued it. The statement's very tough. I talked about revolutionary takeover of the campuses. And after that statement, uh, which was... It, it, the polls we took in Oregon and things showed the entire country virtually supported a hard line that these were overprivileged people and they were unrepresentative. They had all these privileges and things. And so the, the whole shift had taken place from the 19, from the 19, uh, six early, I mean the Goldwater years. And that's one of the reasons at this point, George Wallace was soaring in the polls at 15% nationally as a third party candidate. This, that caused Rockefeller, Rockefeller denounced Nixon's statement, which I had drafted, and then he re-entered the race, and frankly, he won the Massachusetts primary immediately, which was us, we were, I must say, we were asleep at the switch on that one. But he you was were, back uh, in the race, so asleep we Asleep, because you didn't expect Rockefeller to come back we in. We didn't Rockefeller to come back in, and we weren't looking at the Massachusetts primary. We were more worried about Reagan. Yeah, we were worried about Reagan, yeah. and I was. I mean, I yeah. felt, my view was that after the Goldwater thing, Goldwater and Nixon, the only one that could beat Nixon was Reagan pulling off enough conservatives, right. deny us the nomination, and then a Republican convention could stampede to the Gipper. He had charisma, he was fresh, he was new, and he was a tremendous speaker, and he was in his prime. A very Collected sharp, governor. much sharper Pat, edge. Pat wanted to days. save that for eight years later. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted him for a VP. <laughs> now, right. this is, now this is, this is May 28th, and the huge event was the first defeat by a Kennedy in a political primary general election since the end of World War II. Jack Kennedy never lost. I was there at the Benson Hotel, so was Dwight, when uh, Bobby Kennedy lost to Eugene McCarthy. Bobby was in trouble because they had leaked word. Word was in the press that he had wiretapped Dr. King, which was a real offense after Dr. King's assassination, and Kennedy had been attorney general then. But anyhow, the Gene McCarthy won. Shelley and I were at the Benson Hotel. Dwight was there. Everybody was there. So I went down to the front door. We went down, I should say. Bobby Kennedy got out with his dog and Teddy White. And then he came in and gave a concession speech. And while I was not a fan of Bobby Kennedy, it was the most gracious concession speech I think I've heard. I was enormously impressed with him. I had not met him, but I was a few feet away from him. And how gracious he was, and then let's go on now to congratulations, Gene McCarthy, let's go on to California, which he did a week later. <coughs> and that, of course, was one week later exactly, went to that night, Bobby Kennedy was shot to death in the kitchen, or shot and died about 24 hours later, in the kitchen in the Los Angeles Hotel where he was celebrating his phenomenal victory. I was in New York, I got a call from Jeff Bell, who was the staffer, and I, I, when he called me, I called Mr. Nixon. He was already up. Julie and David had been watching the events in California. But it was a horrendous, horrendous tragedy. I think the, Mr. Nixon went to the funeral, but the train took Bobby Kennedy, of course, that eight or 10 hours down to bury him <coughs> next to his brother in Arlington. It was just, uh, you know, the politics were poisoned. It was just poisoned by what was going on. On that morning after uh, Senator Kennedy was killed, I got to the apartment around 9 o'clock, 
And by the time I got there, James Rowley, the head of the Secret Service, was upstairs with uh, Mr. Nixon mm -hmm. and with uh, Chuck Zaboro and Bill Duncan, the two agents mm -hmm. that became our agents through the rest of the campaign. I mean, that the, the, the coverage of these other candidates happened, I mean, they, just instantaneously. They went right on them, yep, yep. Why don't you move from there? Now this is a, what you're gonna see next is a picture of Justice Abe Fortas. Why is he there? Because one week after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Earl Warren concluded that Richard Nixon had a real chance to replace him. Uh, and, and because he was about to retire, Nixon had a chance to be president. Earl Warren wanted to stop that and prevent that. We're all arguing about the Supreme Court now. This was one of the great battles that began the battles of the Supreme Court. Earl Warren resigned, but he made his resignation contingent upon the Senate acceptance of his replacement who was Justice Abe Fortas, who was LBJ's crony. And LBJ then nominated Homer Thornberry to take Abe Fortas' associate justice's seat. So the fix was clearly in. And Mr. Nixon didn't want to get to involved in the battle against you know, Fortas and the battle against the warren Fortas <coughs> combination. But a lot of us on the staff were anxious to, and we're working with some senators up on the Hill, John Tower, Howard Baker, Bill Brock, Bill Brock was one of the main ones. And so after a number of months, Fortas was denied confirmation and Warren stayed on the court until Nixon was elected and Nixon replaced him with, just, with Warren Berger, a judge from Minnesota. Let's go on to the next one. This is the end of June. Now between these events, before this is a Republican convention, but yeah, this is the Nixon down at Miami Beach there was a little bit of tear gas around there, and oh, yeah. and uh, and it was a and Nixon's great. I mean, his the most controversial decision there was the man beside him, Spiro T. Agnew. After Nixon picked Agnew, it was very controversial, and the press went wild, especially our friendly press. Why did you do this? Agnew had been tremendously tough on the riots of April, denouncing Stokely Carmichael, who had come to Boston, uh, Baltimore, and everything. And so Nixon invited me up to watch Agnew's speech, where he accepted, you know? <laughs> and it was just Nixon and I, and Nixon sat there watching the TV, and Agnew was his usual, you know, tough customer self. And Nixon turned to me and said, Buchanan, I think we've got ourselves a hanging judge. <laughs> <coughs> can I, and he turned out to be such. Can I interject here? Sure. We don't have a slide, but you alluded to it in, about uh, Reagan, we should have. Uh, had a slide in there uh, because he w later on when we were writing the memoirs uh, about the 68 campaign he talked about his big concern about Reagan making a, a, a big ru uh, run at the very end there right and that he was very concerned about it and that's where Strom Thurmond came into play that's there exactly was, right the long gray line that didn't break and exactly there were three guys there were three solid conservatives it was Goldwater it was John Tower and it was Strom Thurmond and Thurman was the key to the South, right. Nixon's key to the South. And of course, he loved Reagan, Thurman did, but he had given his loyalty to us. And I remember at the convention, guys were saying, what are we gonna do with Thurman? So we said, take him out on a boat and keep him offshore so Reagan <laughs> can't get to him. <laughs> but I will say this, this was a near run thing. And we had a picture of all of us in the room with Nixon when he went over the top. But the idea of, of breaking Nixon at the convention Nixon had won all the primaries and he had the party core with him, but a lot of conservatives stayed with Reagan and it was a Reagan-Rockefeller effort to break Nixon on the first ballot and hope the whole thing broke open. Right. But I always felt that if the convention started to move to, to Reagan, the Rockefeller people would come to us. But if it moved to Rockefeller, the Reagan people would come to us so that even if it, we didn't win on the first ballot, we had a we had an excellent chance of winning down line because Nixon was the one centrist candidate who could unite the party. Right. He'd been a uniter for whatever you, whatever people say about him, Republican Party never had a more loyal guy who was out there constantly than Richard Nixon, and that's one reason why he's president. Now this is the Democrats of Chicago. I asked Nixon, uh, I, because I thought this would be interesting to a young journalist if he would send me to Chicago for the convention because I thought it might be pretty exciting. <laughs> so I got out to, I, he set me up and we went into, a, I went into the 
what I call the Comrade Hilton Hotel. <laughs> and it was right there on Michigan Avenue, and we had a suite on the 19th floor, and my room was on the 19th floor, and we would invite up journalists and talk to them. And to be, we were very polite. We were, didn't want to you know, make ourselves obnoxious at all, just quote. We'd give them various quotes to put into their stories. And on Wednesday night, into the, I was in there by myself, and in walks Norman Mailer, the, the novelist. He walks in with, the, uh, with Jose Torres, the light heavyweight champion. And it's me and Mailer, and he's, he and I are arguing and talking and arguing. And we hear a ruckus outside, so we went to the window, all of us, all three of us, and we looked out, and there on Balbo was a phalanx of cops had come down. They had held up Michigan Avenue at Balbo, and the front of the, front of the Comrade Hilton had a line of cops here, and this phalanx took off into Grant Park, where I'd been the night before. They were just obnoxious. They were calling everyone names, calling the police names, insulting them. And these cops had had enough, and they went in and just wailed on these demonstrators and rioters and protesters for 15 minutes with their clubs and dragging them to the paddy wagons and throwing them in. And we were sitting up there watching it. Mailer didn't say a word. Jose Torres was cussing the cops. And I was silently approving of what the cops had done since I had been down, down there in that crowd. But my friend, future friend Hunter Thompson was down there as well. And Hunter said, uh, Richard Nixon is president of the United States because of what happened those 15 minutes in front of the, in front of the Hilton Hotel in Chicago. And I think that's right. The picture that went out to the country was the cops fighting the demonstrators and rioters and protesters in the streets, beating them up. And on the floor of the convention, Abe Ribicoff saying, we wouldn't have, if we had George McGovern as president, we wouldn't have Gestapo tactics in the streets of Chicago. This is Abe Ribicoff from the convention floor. And of course, you see that famous shot of Daly yelling. Booing. It's more than booing. booing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was cutting loose with an awful lot of language, the mayor of Chicago was. But that was the inside of the convention. And the outside, they got this brawl going on. I did have one incident. I, I, you know, Tom Wicker was the most famous liberal columnist in the country, a gifted writer for the New York Times. And I got caught outside the day before that Wednesday. And, you know, I got caught in all the tear gas, and so I was running down Michigan and trying to get in the hotels, and the guys in the hotels would push you back into the street. They wouldn't let you in. So I got to my own hotel, the Hilton, and I put the card in, and I went down to the men's room in the basement, and I got the water was washing all this tear gas out of my eyes. And right beside me was Tom Wicker washing the tear gas out of his eyes. So I said it wasn't a total loss. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you know, that I went back to Nixon, and, and as I write in my book, I went back to Nixon, I wrote, because Nixon brilliantly, the folks in New York, decided to schedule then a first trip to Chicago and motorcade right through the city, which a week <coughs> before had been torn to pieces and Nixon would motorcade <coughs> through it. And I sent him a note, I said, you ought to, what you ought to do when you come out here, sir, criticize what the cops did as excessive, but to basically put us on the side of law and order and appeal to the silent majority. It's right there in one of my memos, <laughs> and there it was. And eventually it would, it would, it would recur over a year later. Mm -hmm. But they, they, the scheduling, the first scheduling we had for that September was terrific. Huge motorcades through towns, Philadelphia. Philadelphia was one, Chicago, I remember that, and, and the others. And so Nixon, by the time we got to October 1, here's how they lined up. Nixon was at 43, Humphrey was at 28, George Corley Wallace was at 21% of the vote nationally. Wow. It was astonishing, and that's when uh, Hubert Humphrey threw his desperation pass. Right there you see the Hubert Humphrey, September 30th. Humphrey, is, he'd had a hellish September. Even when he campaigned with Teddy Kennedy, the crowds would yell, dump the hump, dump the hump. He couldn't, get, he couldn't even talk to the crowds. He, at times he was weeping, he was calling them fascists. You know, you felt sorry for the guy because he wasn't even having a campaign. He couldn't get his message through. And so Humphrey went out, and the reason was the war issue, was the left wing of the Democratic Party was tormenting him. And so Humphrey, on the 30th of uh, September, made a speech in Salt Lake City saying, I would halt, halt the bombing as a gesture to try to bring peace in Vietnam. And immediately, a lot of the left 
stopped harassing him and said, if you, if you mean it, we're with you. So Humphrey started at that point, started at 28%, Nixon at 43. We ended dead even. Let me, let me interject something here. Right. <clears throat> so on this day, we are checking into the Cadillac Hotel in Detroit, Michigan, and Pat comes into the suite. We've just gotten into the suite, and he says to Mr. Nixon, he said, Hubert just broke from Johnson in Salt Lake City. And Nixon says to me, get Johnson on the phone. Mm -hmm. I've never, didn't know what to do. I went and found Rose Woods, and she says, you dial 202-456-1414. You bet. And <laughs> talk to the operator. So I got the operator, I called, I got the operator on the phone. I said, I have the former vice president sitting here who would like to talk to President Johnson. And so there's silence for uh, about 20 or 30 seconds. And she comes back on and she says, can you put the former vice president on the phone so we can identify him? And I said, surely. And so I hand him the phone. He's sitting right, stand, right there by me. And the next thing I hear is, hi, Millie, yes. How's Susan? You know, and he knew all the operators. So he's <laughs> identifying himself by this friendliness with the operators. <clears throat> then there is this silence. And then you hear, hi, Mr. President, this is Dick Nixon. I just heard what Hubert did, and I wanted to call and let you know I'm still with you. <laughs> huge. It huge. was huge. Well, let now, me go ahead. You go well, ahead. Well, what I urged Nixon to do, I said, this is going to unite, Humphrey's going to unite this party. If he brings that left with him, he's got the Democratic establishment with him, he's going to unite this party, and let's remember this party beat us by two to one in 1964. I refuse, always compared it, I said, it's like the Union Army. Look, if the Union Army gets united and the Confederates don't keep them divided, once it's united, it's a mammoth machine and it'll run right over the Confederate army. I said, the Democratic Party is far bigger than we are, and if Humphrey unites them, I said, go after Humphrey and attack him for putting at risk the Americans on the DMZ and the others who, when you stop the bombing, are going to be under fire and they're going to be facing the guns that are coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail when we give up bombing of North Vietnam. And the President Nixon did not do it. I always felt he should. But Humphrey started from that day. You could feel the momentum coming, moving day after day. And let's move on. There's another event here. You, you should know there's a, there's a tape of that conversation between LBJ and Nixon that's available at the archives. And oh. at the, Did we make it? No. At, 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 the White House made yeah. it. At, at, at the Mellor Center for the Study of Presidency also <laughs> has it. And uh, in that uh, tape, uh, Johnson <coughs> goes on and on about the damage Did it would do to the troops. Years. If they, stop the, if, okay. if they stop the bombing. And he's criticizing Humphrey and Nixon. Yeah. Okay, Go now ahead. this is General Curtis LeMay, the guy that firebombed Tokyo in World War II, the American commander whom George Wallace decided to put on as vice president. And he had a press conference on October 3rd, right after the Humphrey thing. And General LeMay came out, and Wallace was on the, side, on the behind the curtain there, and he was asked immediately if he would use nuclear weapons in Vietnam. And General LeMay indicated he didn't understand all this concern with nuclear weapons, that he had blown one off, a hydrogen bomb off Bikini Atoll, and the vegetation was all back and everything. He said, <laughs> except the sand crabs were a little hot. <laughs> At that point, <laughs> Governor Wallace came out, <laughs> circled around the general, and took took him away, <laughs> and Wallace started declining. Wallace, as I say, was at 21%. More than a fifth of the nation was going to vote for Wallace. But he started down in the polls, and the problem with this was, he started down in the polls, he was losing his Northern Catholics. And the Northern Catholics weren't coming to Nixon. They were going home to the party of their fathers. Wow. And they were going home. All those Wallace voters they said Nixon was getting, we didn't get any. In the North, they all went to Humphrey. All, you know, he got, he got, eventually Humphrey, as I say, got a 15-point bounce in, in October 
for his stance and because Wallace was declining. Mainly so, from Wallace, not, oh, not, yeah, the, not from Nixon. No, he didn't get Nixon held at 43 unless there was some change in the, the vote, it, the kind of vote itself. But Nixon, we did, this is one thing that always <coughs> bothered me. We didn't move an inch. Hmm. We spent all this money, 25 million on ads. We didn't go, for, we went from 43 to 43. Okay, here's Johnson, uh, October 31, and Ken can talk about this in great detail. President Johnson announced a bombing halt on the last day of October, and, and it, it, was a, it was an October surprise. It had been all worked up. The whole idea was to pieces at hand, to push Humphrey over the line. Johnson was basically agreeing with Humphrey now, and so uh, this thing was explosive, but that was on a Thursday, and on the Saturday, I went into Nixon, we were in LA by then. I went in with Nixon and I told him John Sears called and said, uh, we've lost Michigan and we're down 43-40 in the Harris poll, which meant we'd lost the nation, everything we'd done for three years. I thought we were finished, frankly. I thought we were gonna lose the election, but I went in, Nixon was watching the Oregon, with BB, watching the Oregon Ducks play USC. <laughs> and I gave him this information First and he was, okay, heard. thanks, thanks. Let's, <laughs> You know, what's, I, you know, I was just, I had to hit my hands were breaking out in hives and everything. But he, I will say he just took it extraordinarily well, you know. And October, uh, uh, election eve. Okay, election eve, Nixon, this was, That's we a did telephone. a telethon. And I tell you who put it together, a fellow named Roger Ailes, 28 years old, put together this telethon. And it was a two hour telethon that began in Los Angeles. I was in the back room with Rose Woods the, girl, the gals would take the messages and get the questions, they'd bring them back to me. I would put them in Nixonian language, the questions of me, they just throw, say, Social Security and stuff. Nixon asked me to get Social Security in twice every hour as a question. And so then they'd take a pack of the questions out and they would ask Nixon the questions and Nixon would respond. After he did a two hour telethon, he took an hour break and said, let's do another two hour telethon. This is the night before the election and so he went through those and later on, he said he thinks that this was nationwide television. He thinks this was the thing that put him back over the top. This and the South Vietnamese saying, we're not going to Paris. This is a setup and, and as Ken can tell you, President Chu had decided long before that they weren't going to Paris because this was not, uh, that, that he wanted Nixon quite frankly elected. And then yeah. Nixon won. Yep. So you could say, if you were just going across the big picture, that there's two major themes for the 68 campaign, end the war and restore law and order. But what we've asked our, our panelists to do, and Pat included, Pat gave you the, the chronology, is go back through and share some other campaign memories that may not be as well known. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we, we, Ken or Annalise, just <coughs> d chime in. What do you remember as the most significant part of the campaign? Well, there, were the, there was the mundane aspects of the campaign that, you know, we, we don't generally talk about, which is the pol we had a, uh, an extraordinary policy operation um, within not only at the headquarters there where Alan Greenspan was a domestic uh, policy advisor, my boss, but we had a uh, policy operation in Washington headed by John Tower. It's called a Key Issues Committee. And uh, John Tower had several of, of the uh, uh, staff people that worked for him and for others in the Senate and the House uh, helping with various policy issues, domestic, uh, mainly domestic policy issues. I, my specialty was agriculture. I was the only one that knew how to spell farm <laughs> <laughs> in New York. Len, Len Garman came to my office one, once and said, what does a dirt farmer really want to know? I mean, it was really sort of a stupid question because <laughs> that's not how farmers thought, but uh, they weren't dirt farmers, they were sophisticated people. But uh, um, we had a Nixon Agri Agricultural Advisory Committee, but we had a whole wide spectrum of policy people run by John Tower out of that uh, key issues committee, mm -hmm. and I thought that was mm -hmm. very significant. Mm -hmm. Annalise, you told me earlier, we were rehearsing this, about the logistical challenges in that era of y oh. you're at home base and the campaign plane is out there in the hinterlands and there's no That's computers. Right. Uh, the Goldwater, people who worked for Goldwater had told Martin 
that once the plane left the ground, it was if, as if they were in a sealed tube and they lost touch with headquarters. So whatever headquarters was doing, whatever research was being done, uh, experts who might be available, it was hard to reach them. We had no cell phones. We had no computers. The materials that people used on the airplane were physical, pieces of paper and books. And so Martin worked on setting it up that Ken and I and the other people in the research department, Greenspan and, and Dick Allen, would be available by telephone. And in addition to the, to the people, the red phone would ring and we would answer and respond to d demands from the campaign. We had a guy on a, we had a guy that motorcycle, he was a volunteer, and every night he would go to the New York Times headquarters and as they printed the paper and threw it off the truck for the first delivery, he would get two copies, bring it back to headquarters, and we'd cut it up and fax it to the campaign, which took six minutes a page. It was, you can imagine that. Was that a quick, quick machine? That was, it was, that was the digiphone. You know, let me tell you. And we had the Twix. You know, well, the, in Nixon in, in uh, 68, in the primaries, Agnes Waldron would go down and get the Washington Post and the yeah. New York Times and send these, as you say, took six, six minutes a page. Right. They would give them to me and then I would mark the paragraphs, the various paragraphs which should be typed up and they would be typed up and put on a pile of a, a thick, thick bond paper and they would be put into Nixon's room <laughs> So that he would get the his new newspaper, what on the East Coast Press, at the same time folks got it back east, and right. he could walk out and tell these New York Times reporters what they had written, you know, and there, where, where did you get the Times, you, you know, and so uh, right. it was a tremendous, it was an original news summary thing that eventually Nixon took into a made a major instrument of policy in the Nixon White House under Mort Allen. I remember it well, Dwight. <laughs> I wanted to raise a subject. Uh, on Nixon's birthday in 1968, he went down to go on the Mike Douglas show. And there was a young man there, <clears throat> same age as Pat and myself, and he came up to him and started talking to him, and his name was Roger Ailes. And <clears throat> whereas Joe McGinnis, uh, in his book, re references the fact that Nixon in 1960 was somewhat afraid of this thing called television. Roger Ailes looked Nixon in the eye and said, sir, <clears throat> you need to make television your friend. And <clears throat> when we left there, uh, Mr. Nixon said, I want you to arrange for that man to go meet R Ray Price, was the first stop on, in the line of things. And Roger came up the next week and met with Ray Price, and then he met with Garment and Shakespeare and the others that Harry Trelevin, the people that were part of the television team. And one of the most significant things about 1968 was Nixon's use of television. Mm -hmm. For a person who everyone thought was not good on television, and it, the whole myth of that spun out of the Jack Kennedy debate, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Nixon mastered it television. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pat talks about the telethon on election night, but we had these television uh, programs called The Man in the Arena, where Nixon would stand in the center and there were either citizens or press people all around him, in a, and he had just a stand-up mic, and they could go right at him and he could answer. And, and this was incredibly effective in this campaign. Right. You but, know, let but, me mention, we did, we, Roger Ailes also did the telethon the night of the Oregon primary. And again, Nixon was there, and Bud Wilkinson, the coach of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. was a big supporter of his. He would, he, would, uh, he would ask the questions, and Nixon would answer, well, what this, the way we use television, or the, Dwight and the others, everyone used television then, was to l look at the man, Nixon, and look at his strengths. You know, he's not Car Ronald Reagan up there with a charismatic speech or something. Oh, Nixon gave a great speech at his convention. But what he was extremely good was his knowledge, his ability to articulate, to speak briefly, to, to speak at certain lengths, to get information in, 
his press conferences as president, where every one of them would show him rising. These were really, the man had knowledge, experience, ability, an excellent mind, and the, the things were built around and his strengths. It, okay. the, the, build, okay. the, the whole media was mm -hmm. built around, this is what we have, this is what his strong suit is, let's show the strong suit constantly. We took uh, one other quick thing. We, we made these, all of these trips to Florida over and over and over <laughs> again. Great stop. Tan, rested, and ready. I mean, he exactly. went down there for the sun. I, I carried a, a, a suitcase. Uh, Pat razzes me about it. I was an expert at pouring coffee, but <laughs> I also carried a suitcase, and in that suitcase was a sun lamp. And every single day, we would spend like 45 seconds in front of that, he would in front of that sun lamp that kept, because his skin had that transparent mm -hmm. quality that you mm -hmm. may have read about. Yeah, Teddy and, White and so, made a big But thing the way that the you countered it, the way he looked fantastic, right. all the way through that campaign was that sun lamp. It, right, wasn't only, it was not only the sun lamp. We, as we said, in 1960, I read Teddy White's book, we all did, and they, Teddy White was talking about how Kennedy was babbling at the end. He'd done so many events. And, and uh, Nixon had done so many events, he's ir got irritable and everything. And we had a famous memo from Haldeman in 67. He said, look, you can take every event you do during the campaign and all these speeches and things like that, you'll probably see four or five million people in person. One night on TV, you can see 20 or 30 million. So look good on the TV for the 20 or 30 million. There's two deadlines, a morning newspaper, evening newspaper, evening, evening TV. So what we did, I remember in New Hampshire, We'd take Nixon up and work him for two, two and a half days. Then we'd head for that Manchester airport, get on the Learjet, Dwight Florida, and I and Ray, Florida. Ray Price, head for Florida and Key Biscayne into fantastic. the pool. fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Romney's up there committing suicide in New, the snows of New Hampshire. But Nixon makes all these, these various stops, and all of them look good. And what fills the empty space in New Hampshire are the ads of Nixon answering questions. So the whole thing, I mean, Nixon learned tremendously from the, the mistakes of 1960. I mean, 1960 and, and, and by 1968 was just a, a dramatic change. That's, that's why he's president of the United States. Yes, yes, well, there's he, no question about it. He was also able to delegate the details. Well, the organization of the campaign in 1968 is critically important. He, he, he delegated, he gave Mitchell the campaign, and he gave Haldeman responsibility for running him, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he gave Ehrlichman responsibility for running the tour. <clears throat> and in the operations, we had people who were not there because they were making money. They were there because they were professionals who believed in Richard Nixon. And it, and it had gave a whole different cast to the campaign than what you get now when you put together a presidential campaign mm -hmm. and you buy all of this various talent mm -hmm. and try to put it together and, and, and assume that they are committed to the candidate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the Nixon alumni, when you go through them, and we, uh, many of them have departed the scene, so to speak, uh, <clears throat> to the hereafter, but our group of people, I would put them up against anyone in ter any campaign in mm -hmm. terms of the competence, in mm -hmm. terms of their loyalty, the capability, and so forth, and, mm -hmm. and it was a marvelous organization. Mm -hmm. Super. I'm going to move on because we're running out of time. Well, Go ahead, Kim. You're asking about memories, and one, one memory is that we, we developed great mentors in these campaigns, and one of them that we, we should not ignore is a great man named Bryce Harlow. Yes, and uh, uh, definitely. Uh, Bryce Harlow was this a young man who came out of Oklahoma, and he, he knew shorthand, so he became a clerk to General George Marshall, and then he worked his way up, and he and became in, to Eisenhower. He was a speechwriter for President Eisenhower, and, and then uh, uh, became a lobbyist to Procter & Gamble, but he was also one of the wisest and greatest mm -hmm. men in Washington, and he became a, an assistant in this campaign, and became my mentor because uh, I was his contact at the headquarters to take his phone calls and whatnot, mm -hmm. and he protected me against uh, 
Senators Carl Mutt and Milton Young when they harassed me. <laughs> <laughs> on agriculture. On agriculture. agriculture. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the, the thing about, other thing about Bryce Harlow is that uh, he, had a <laughs> he had a double agent in the White House and uh, the, uh, he, he knew every move President Johnson was making in advance on that bombing halt so that there was no secrets at all because Bryce was so well known in Washington, he still had people in the White House he knew. But quite beyond that, Bryce Harlow was one of the greatest Americans I know. Mm -hmm. And these fellows traveled with him, too, as well. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he's just one of the wisest yeah, I can and, remember and Bryce finest men. Very briefly, during the transition, Johnson called him, and Eisenhower called him, and Nixon called him. And Bryce said, you know, within an hour, I've talked to two presidents and one future, <laughs> one president to be. <laughs> no, right, right. He was a, he was, a, he was enormously well liked by everyone in the city. He Respected became, he became the head of government affairs when he became Nixon legislative, took uh, yeah. legislative he, guy. He told me that on his first day when he got into the office, there were 435 phone calls. <laughs> you know, everybody went, you know, from the Hill. Yeah, I mean, they all wanted yeah. to talk to Bryce. Yeah. In, in Teddy White's book on 1968, which is an excellent, an excellent <laughs> book to read in terms of the campaign, he makes the point about. The, the Nixon people having, the Nixon having strategy and preparation. And I would like to tell a quick story about uh, 1967. We are in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, up in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it's around six o'clock in the morning and the two of us are going down. We had a volunteer that was driving the car and we are off to a radio station. <clears throat> Mr. Nixon is in the back of the car. You can hear the pin scratching. He had the light on back there. He's got his yellow pad out on his uh, briefcase on his lap, and he's making his notes, getting ready for this radio interview. We arrive at the radio station, and it's one room, and the guy that's going to interview him is also the engineer. Yes. He probably, he probably also sold the time for the radio station. I don't know. But, but it was so, made such an indelible uh, impression upon me about who this man was and his, and his desire to, to, to prepare himself and to be ready for everything. And, and that is what really was one of the side benefits of the Haldeman Memorandum. Mm -hmm. Because in the Haldeman Memorandum, when Bob wrote that, he has a section called Strategy and Thinking Time. And that whole thinking time element was something that we carried right in onto the schedule, all of yes. the scheduling in the White House yes. that I was involved with for five years. Okay. We had thinking time. We're going to stop because I, I watched the clock. And we're going to go through Nixon wins. <clears throat> you know, this is November 6th, the day after uh, the, the, the happy group. Nixon has prevailed. And now what we're going to do is, is go back and we have uh, about a minute and a half each. We're doing these forums to help guide future researchers and scholars through complex topics. Think through for a second, because I've warned you beforehand, what topics are ripe for research that you don't think are fully appreciated uh, in today's literature? And Ken, we'll start with you. Well, there are several topics that I've worked with on the bombing halt, and, and uh, one is that uh, the President Johnson was truly agonized about whether to do the bombing halt to begin with because I've gone through the LBJ tapes. He taped himself. We didn't tape him. He taped himself. And he was agonized about it. He was pushed by his own staff, uh, some of it against his own wishes. And, and a lot of it was for pers uh, the political strategy of the Democrats to have the bombing halt help Humphrey. Harriman, who was the negotiator in Paris was a partisan Democrat who hated Nixon, was working with Clark Clifford to push the bombing halt to get Humphrey over the line. That's one aspect. Another thing that uh, we ought to look at, which is in Teddy White's book in 1968, which has been much overlooked and, and mentioned in Tom Wicker's book as well, and also mentioned uh, uh, by, um, uh, in Clark Clifford's book about, uh, uh, by Harriman, is that the Russians were very much involved in trying to get Humphrey elected. So there's a Russian collusion story 
that, oh, wow. that, uh, oh, wow. that uh, scholars ought to start looking about. The Russians very okay. much wanted to get Hubert okay. Humphrey elected. Dwight, you were talking last night, forgive me, just because I found this interesting, about the advance manual and the development of the advance manual. What, could, could you recall that for us? Do you remember saying that? Does that take from my two minutes? Yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> no, I, I made the point that, that Billy Graham had said to Richard Nixon, Vice President of the United States, in 1960, have one of your men come down to Montreat. I can show them what we do. And Bob Haldeman went to Montreat, uh, North Carolina, and he met with the Billy Graham people, and they showed him the manual that they used when they went in to establish crusades in various cities in America. And as we, those of us that are older know that these crusades were mammoth things and highly organized. And, and Bob took the Billy Graham manual and went back and adapted it for advancement for the 1960 uh, campaign. And then in 1962, John Ehrlichman took that advanced man's manual and adapted it for the California campaign. And then John was also in charge of the advanced man for 1968, and they used that Billy Graham originated advance man's manual to uh, take care of the 1968 campaign. And, <clears throat> and the important thing about it is the degree of organization that is in it is phenomenal, and everything is highly controlled. And uh, one thing about President Nixon, he, he could handle, or candidate Nixon, I should say, he could handle spontaneous things, but he didn't want to. He wanted to have everything thought through. He wanted to know exactly how it was going to work, what was expected, no surprises of just, any kind. Just, just like this forum. Yeah. Everything, we, we know what's right. going to be said. Now you get your two minutes, but, but be quick. Okay. Uh, I think it would be interesting for a researcher to go in and, and investigate this whole thing about presidential debate commissions, because our strategy in 68 was not to debate. And uh, the way that the commission is set up now, it's like they ordain that there are going to be these debates. And that is one of the most significant ca campaign strategy decisions that can be made. And maybe candidates should decide that they're not going to debate. I'm not against public exposure of issues, but I think it's a campaign subject that needs to be looked into. The other thing I w uh, wanted to mention is that the young lady that was holding a sign in Deschler, Ohio, that said, Mr. Nixon, bring us together again. That, that was, that's huge, and in this country at this time, it would be interesting to go back and go and look at the, the di division from the war and everything else, how Mr. Nixon handled that at the convention. His convention speech in Miami was one of the, it was a work of art. It is one of the best speech, political speeches that anyone can ever read or understand. Thank you. Pat? Uh, I would say of Richard Nixon as as political figure, uh, he, along with FDR, are the only two Americans on five national tickets that you should go back and study Richard Nixon, young naval officer like Jack Kennedy coming out in 1946, going after Alger Hiss in the great anti-communist era of the late 1940s and 50s. Then you see him moving in and winning the hugest Senate landslide in California history, becoming vice president, the idea of, of running against Kennedy, this, this new era is opening up the 60s, and how it was that he came through after these defeats through the 1960s, the cultural, social, moral revolutions that were going on then, racial revolutions, civil rights, and all the rest of it, and the extraordinary ability he had to, if you will, move through all of these wars. It looks like, I remember War and Peace, they had the doctor going across the battlefield. Both armies are going <laughs> at each other, and he's going right through and surviving it all. And how Nixon rose to make himself not only president of the United States, but the greatest landslide in American presidential history, given, given what he had gone through and the opposition he had. I think it's just a political figure. I think it's been said incorrectly.
is the dominant figure of the, of the third quarter of the 20th century, sure. far sure. and away. And many people say, I've seen others say he's the most important figure because I think he gave birth to the new majority that Ronald Reagan built upon and in 1980 and 84. Nixon birthed that new majority out of the Wallace, Humphrey, all of these, and the force, Goldwater forces, old Republicans, and put together the greatest majority since the New Deal majority. Thank you, and we're gonna end with Annalise. Yes, I think the National Archives are a great resource, and the Nixon Library in Yorba Belinda is a terrific resource. And what I would do, if I were going to do more research on Richard Nixon, is I would go back to the things he wrote by hand. And Pat Buchanan's <coughs> book is a great example of this, mm -hmm. of the memos. Uh, Nixon responds to people who send him memos. And a lot of those are in Pat's book, but there are other handwritten things. Uh, my late husband's papers, Martin Anderson, are going to be released at the Hoover Institution, and Nixon wrote things to Martin. Mm -hmm. And he said, I agree with this, let's proceed with this. Mm -hmm. right. or, and and mm -hmm. what he himself says that results in all the rest mm -hmm. of this, mm -hmm. I think is very important. And and we end there, we've ended on time. We began with compliments of the National Archives. This was not rehearsed. We <laughs> end with compliments to the National Archives. Thank you all for coming. Program's over. We're gonna ask, we're gonna ask the Nixon alumni to stay for a few minutes because we wanna chat with them for just a couple minutes, but give the, give the public the opportunity to depart. Thank you very, very much for coming. Now we get a picture. If, if you guys, wait, 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 wait